Welcome to my complete examination of Felina, the series finale of Breaking Bad. This video is intended to be a rundown of the events found in the episode in order to assess quality, while also relating the events of the episode to their relevance in the wider context of the show as a whole. This video will contain heavy spoilers for all of Breaking Bad, so please watch before you see this video. If you do not care about spoilers or have seen it before, then I'll begin. The episode opens showing Walter White as he enters into a car seeing that the owner forgot to lock it. Once inside, he acquires a screwdriver from the glove box and struggles to hotwire the car. After stopping in frustration, the light of a police siren silently appears from behind him. As he cowards from the police, he quietly begs the car to just get him home so that he can do the rest. Just get me home. Just get me home. I'll do the rest. To his luck, the squad car passes and Walt discovers that the driver left the keys in the visor. This stroke of luck is an element of the episode which could be called a contrivance which is designed to push the story forward. The reason this isn't a flaw in the story is that it is a contrivance which doesn't require a massive leap in logic. It is entirely plausible, if unlikely, that a vehicle owner would leave their keys in their car. But a detail which assists this element is that the driver left the door unlocked, indicating that the vehicle's owner was likely negligent or nonchalant with the security of his car. Walt starts the car and punches off the snow which served as a shield from the police off of his window. As Walt clears his windshield of snow to set off, the iconic opening titles and main theme play for a final time. We then cut to a gas station in the desert. As was shown in the premiere of the season, Walt has driven from New Hampshire back to Albuquerque. After refueling his car and coughing down some of his few remaining medications, Walt makes a call at the gas station's payphone. Acting as a journalist from the New York Times, Walt manages to get the new address of Elliot and Gretchen. It's, it's, it's their call. I know how busy Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz are. Should make one hell of a story. Goodbye. After finishing his call, Walt removes the tag hewer Jesse gave him for his 51st birthday and places it on top of the payphone before he departs. The reason that he did this narratively is somewhat unclear. As was shown in the previous shot, just like his finger which has grown too thin to hold his wedding ring, Walt's wrist is exceedingly thin for his watch. In spite of this, the watch has an adjustable band and could have been tightened. It could mean that Walt is leaving behind one of the last remaining memories he has of Jesse. But this doesn't explain why he has kept it for all this time while he was in New Hampshire. Narratively, this moment is somewhat jarring and likely meant to create an emotionally striking shot. On a production standpoint, this is actually done as a means to avoid a potential continuity error. Walt wasn't wearing the tag hewer in the series premiere. But unlike his glasses, hair, and clothes, there wasn't a narrative reason for Walt not to be wearing his watch. It wasn't damaged in previous seasons, and he never lost it. Thus, Vince Gilligan had Walt leave it on the payphone. It's a little detail which shows the immense care the filmmakers took to ensuring that even the most minuscule of details regarding continuity on the show were kept consistent, albeit leaving this moment somewhat confusing narratively speaking. We then see Elliot and Gretchen returning home where they neglect to see Walt lurking in the shadows near their porch. After they disable the alarm, Walt ominously walks to the doors and closes them. He then casually walks in and begins admiring the house and pictures on the table. When Gretchen and Elliot eventually become aware that Walt is in their house, they ask why he is there. He claims that he isn't there to hurt them and is instead there to give them something, explaining that said item is in his car and that he couldn't get it past their gate. Hello, Gretchen. Elliot, I really like your new house. What, what, what are you doing here? I saw you on Charlie Rose. You look great. You both did. If you are here to, to hurt us... Well, actually, I'm here to give you something. It's out in my car. How about the three of us take a walk to it? It's just parked down the road. I couldn't get it past your gate. Based on what the audience knows, this very well could be the M60 machine gun which was shown in the premiere. After Elliot threatens Walt with a knife, Walt's crowd-pleasing one-liner implies that this is exactly what is in his car. Elliot, if we're gonna go that way, you'll need a bigger knife. The episode cuts revealing Walt, Elliot, and Gretchen stacking Walt's money on a table in the living room. He then instructs them to give the money to Walter Jr. in the form of a trust on his 18th birthday, claiming that since Elliot and Gretchen are wealthy benefactors, their donation to the White family will be seen as a charitable act rather than a suspicious one. Walt, I don't think- On my son's 18th birthday, which is 10 months and two days from today, you will give him this money in the form of an irrevocable trust. You will tell him that it is his to do with as he sees fit, but with the hope that he uses it for his college education and for the betterment of his family. But to ensure that they follow through with his orders, Walt reveals that there are in fact two hitmen whom Walt is paid to watch Elliot and Gretchen to ensure that they do what he wants. If for any 
reason that my children do not get this money. A kind of countdown will begin. When you're going for a walk in Santa Fe or Manhattan or Prague, wherever, you'll hear the scrape of a footstep behind you. But before you can even turn around. <laughs> Darkness. Yeah! This scene serves as an excellent example of writer-director Vince Gilligan writing the characters of the show with consistency, whilst also subverting the expectations of the audience. The previous episode, Granite State, had shown Walt at possibly his lowest point on the show, having failed to convince Walter Jr. to take his money, and realizing that all of his lies, all of his hard work, and all of the people who died as a result of his actions may all be for nothing. Are you there? Y yes. It's so good to hear your voice. money inside. It has to be a secret. If anyone says a word, the police will take it. I wanted to give you so much more. You want to send money. I don't want anything from you. I don't give a shit. You, you this money killed your Uncle Hank. You no, killed no, him. He needs this no, money. No. It can't all what, be for what nothing. You did? Just Please. Shut up. Shut up. Please. He reaches such a low point that he decides to give up his efforts to evade the authorities and calls the DEA, referring to himself by name. DEA, Albuquerque District Office. How may I direct your call? I'd like to speak to the agent in charge of the Walter White investigation. Who may I say is calling? Walter White. Seeing Elliot and Gretchen on TV is what gave him confidence and a drive to keep going. However, the implication based on the interview and Walt's reaction was that Walt wanted to kill them because of their misrepresentation of him. Walt had shown strong resentment to Grey Matter as well as Elliot and Gretchen over the course of the show. So you run the company with Elliot? Oh, no. Uh, no, that's, that's Gretchen and, and Elliot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I gravitated toward education. Ah, what university? Jesse, have you heard of a company called Grey Matter? Well, I co-founded it in grad school with a couple of friends of mine. Actually, I was the one who named it for personal reasons, I decided to leave the company. And I sold my share to my two partners for $5,000. Now, at the time, that was a lot of money for me. Care to guess what that company is worth now? Uh, millions. Billions, with a B. What would your presumption about me be exactly? that I should go begging for your charity, and you waving your checkbook around like some magic wand is gonna make me forget how you and Elliot, how you and Elliot cut me out. These expectations, however, were subverted, instead showing that Walt had an idea to overcome the fact that Walter Jr. and Skyler won't accept his money. Walt remains consistent in his attempts to take care of his family, while also making it clear that he doesn't want Elliot or Gretchen to pitch in financially in order to form Walter Jr.'s trust. And you are not to spend a single dime of your own money. If there are taxes or lawyers' fees owed, you will take it right from here. They use my money, never yours. He needed their help, but he only reached said point out of desperation. In addition to the consistent character writing, the episode manages to have a crowd-pleasing moment with Walt's snipers threatening Elliot and Gretchen. This is subversive writing done to glorious perfection. It alters the assumptions of the audience based on previous setups, while also surprising them with the final payoff. All while writing the characters with perfect consistency. Following this, it is revealed that the hitman Walt spoke of were in fact Badger and Skinny Pete. A reveal that enforces what Heisenberg ultimately is, mainly a facade created by Walt using theatrics and presentation. Theatricality and deception. Powerful agents to the uninitiated. After paying both of them $10,000, he asked them about the blue mess still being produced, which Walt was informed about earlier on Charlie Rose. Badger believes that Walt is the one who is producing it. Based on the quality that they allude to, Walt deduces that Jesse is in fact the cook who is producing the blue sky meth. As Walt drives off, we cut to a flashback of Jesse working on his box he described back in Season 3, which he made for a school project. I took this um, Votech class in high school, woodworking. My, uh, my project for his class was to make this um, wooden box. And by the end of the semester, by like box number five, I had built this thing. You should have seen it. It was insane. I built it out of Peruvian walnut with 
inlaid zebra wood. It was fitted with pegs, no screws. I sanded it for days until it was smooth as glass. Then I rubbed all the wood with tongue oil so it was rich and dark. It was perfect. A moment which shows Jesse's ability to achieve his goals when he sets his mind to it. After showing Jesse admiring his hard work, we hard cut back to Jesse in the present day still chained to Jack's meth lab. He now has long uncut hair, a beard, and severe facial scars. It is clear that Jesse is severely traumatized both physically and mentally, and has abandoned the previous efforts he had to escape from Jack. Following this, we see a recap of the teasers at the beginning and midpoint of the season. Walt eating breakfast for his birthday, acquiring his M60 machine gun, and taking the ricin capsule from his condemned house. We then cut to Lydia who is still going to the same coffee shop as always to meet with Todd. As she orders chamomile tea, Walt can be seen in the background casually sitting at a table. Before Todd arrives, we get a close-up of her taking the stevia from an assortment of sweeteners. Walt interrupts their awkward conversation, insisting that he has a method for cooking meth which requires no methylamine. After he leaves, Lydia tells Todd that they will have to kill Walt. Before the scene cuts, however, we get an overhead close-up of Lydia pouring stevia into her tea. Walt is then seen in the desert creating a MacGyver-style device that rotates back and forth which is activated by a remote car opener. As he works, his wedding ring necklace falls into view, reminding him of his family. We then see Skylar in her new house. While it seems to be relatively spacious and well-kept, Skylar has returned to smoking and seems to be at odds with Marie based on the message she leaves on the phone. Marie informs Skylar that Walt is in Albuquerque based on what the police have discovered. Skylar tells Marie that she will be on the lookout if Walt is coming for her. When we cut back to Skylar, the camera reveals that Walt is now standing in the kitchen. Both in her conversation with Marie and her second words to Walt, Skylar asks if Walt hurt anyone. He didn't hurt her, did he? he didn't. No, he's just like, hey Becky, or Carol, whatever. You didn't kill anybody sneaking in her, did you? You didn't hurt anybody. Oh. Didn't have to. Walt has gone from being a figure of greed in Skylar's mind to someone who is violent and unpredictable. She is scared of him. He tells Skylar that he came to give her a proper goodbye, claiming that the people who threatened her earlier will never come back to hurt Skylar or her family. He then offers her the lottery ticket containing the coordinates to the bodies of Hank and Steve, telling her that she can trade it for a deal with the prosecutor to get herself out of her situation. Walt then says, Skylar, all the things that I did, you need to understand. I have to hear. One more time that you did this for the family. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. And I was, I was alive. Yeah, bitch! Oh! This is a payoff for one of the show's long-lasting conflicts. Throughout the entire show, Walt had been in constant denial about why he was doing the things he did constantly telling himself it was to pay for his son's education and to give Skylar enough money to support the family after his death. Ten years, that's $240,000 plus $360 plus $137, $737, dollars that's what I need. That is what I need. How much is enough? How big does this pile have to be? I have made a series of very bad decisions, and I cannot make another one. Why did you make these decisions? For the good of my family. The, the things that they're saying about me, I did wrong. I, I made some terrible mistakes. But the reasons were always... While it may have started because of that, it quickly became clear that Walt grew obsessed with his work. And in spite of Skylar catching on to Walt's lies and discovering what he had done, Walt refused to stop lying to her. But worse yet, he refused to stop lying to himself. It wasn't until Walt saw what he had become through the fearful eyes of his wife and son that he realized what he truly was. This is the moment where Walt decides to stop lying to Skylar, but more importantly, he stops lying to himself. Tragically, however, it is too late. While this confession clearly gives Walt a sense of relief, he cannot go back on the things he has done. Just like Walt's revelation to Jesse that he watched Jane die, this is a moment which is significant in providing a payoff for one of the show's most long-running conflicts, and it is done absolutely marvelously. Walt then asks if he can say goodbye to Holly before he leaves. He manages to impart his last bit of love on the daughter he never could raise, and lovingly watches Walter Jr. from a distance before he leaves the lives of his family forever.
We then see Walt's Cadillac as it approaches the locked fence to Jack's complex. Kenny greets him and asks him to drive the car to the clubhouse. In spite of Kenny's instructions, Walt avoids the parking lot and drives the car sideways in front of the clubhouse. Once parked, Frankie gives Walt a pat down, taking his wallet and keys. Kenny goes the extra mile and asks Walt to lift his shirt to ensure that he isn't wearing a wire. Considering the fact that Jack's crew were so thorough in searching Walt's person, it is somewhat convenient that they neglected to search his car. However, Jack's crew outnumber whatever reinforcements could possibly be hiding in the trunk, and Kenny did check the back seat when he met Walt at the gate. Jack's crew are confident that Walt's intentions are either for money or a way to make a deal with the authorities. Therefore, they decided to check Walt's person for weapons and wires before meeting in the clubhouse out of range of the car. Also, Kenny tells one of the crew members to stay outside and keep a lookout, showing that they are still cautious about Walter and understand that it is possible that he brought back up, but assume that they are not hiding in his car. When we enter the clubhouse, Jack opens with casual conversation about Walt's new look, and Walt notices that Frankie places his wallet and keys on the pool table. Is that real? Yes. That's not a wig? Seriously? No. What were you doing before? Shaving it? Yes. Walt asks about his offer to give Jack his meth formula, which requires no methylamine, but Jack tells Walt that they are not in the market. Kenny pulls a pistol on Walt, and Jack instructs him to kill Walt out back. In desperation, Walt taunts Jack, belittling him for not killing Jesse as he promised, and instead choosing to partner with him. Jesse Pinkman, you promised that hey. you would kill him, and you didn't. Come on. Instead, hey. all right, you hey. partner with him. You're his partner now. No, no, that's what you stop. Partners? What are you talking about? He's alive, isn't he? He's cooking for you. What are you, gonna lie? Enraged, Jack instructs Todd to bring Jesse in from the lab and tells Walt that after he sees Jesse, he's going to kill Walt himself. We then cut to outside as Todd walks Jesse to the clubhouse. Jesse's chains rattling as he struggles to keep up with Todd. As Kenny makes himself comfortable in a recliner and Jack lights up a cigarette, Walt manages to get a hold of his keys. When Jesse arrives, Jack begins to taunt Walt. Now, does this look like a partner to you? Come here, take a look. Come here! This is my partner. Right, partner? Right, buddy? Jesse and Walt then slowly exchange tortured glances, both of them now with disheveled hair and beards made weak by time and abuse. Seconds pass before Walt lets out a roar and tackles Jesse to the ground. As Jack instructs Todd to get Walt off of Jesse, Todd, you get him off, you? Walt pushes the button to his remote car opener. As Todd, Walt, and Jesse cower on the floor, Walt reacts as one stray bullet manages to strike him. The gunfire continues to destroy the entire clubhouse with blood and debris everywhere before the belt runs dry, leaving the rotator to move the empty machine gun back and forth. Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! Ah! Yes! Yes! When we cut to the inside of the clubhouse, Kenny's recliner is still moving his lifeless body up and down as the sound of dripping blood is heard. A direct overhead shot confirms that Walt, Jesse, Todd, and Jack are all alive. Likely believing the gunfire to be a cartel or gang hit, Todd cautiously looks outside only to see the gunfire came from the now burning trunk of Walt's car. Todd attempts to talk to Walt only for Jesse to wrap his chains around Todd's neck, screaming as he violently strangles the man who has been the central figure of pain in Jesse's life. As Todd's neck snaps, Walt picks up Kenny's pistol and walks over to Jack. Jesse takes Todd's keys and begins unlocking himself from the chains. As Walt prepares to shoot Jack, he asks him to wait and spitefully picks up his still-lit cigarette from the ground. Wait. Wait. He tells Walt that he knows where the rest of Walt's money is and that if he kills him, he'll never find it. You want your money, right? Huh? You wanna know where it is? You pull that trigger, you never... A satisfying conclusion to one of the most hated characters on the show, which calls back to the moment where Jack killed Hank mid-sentence. Hank, you gotta tell him. You gotta tell him now that we can work this out. Please. Please. What? You want me to beg? You're the smartest guy I ever met. And you're too stupid to see. He made up his mind ten minutes ago. Do what you're gonna do. Whereas Hank accepted his fate and told Jack to do what he had to do, Jack attempts to bribe Walt. 
leaving Jack as a pathetic and sadistic maniac who cowered when placed in the same situation he placed Hank in and died at the hands of a man who Jack believed he had broken. As Jesse frees himself from his chains and stands, he stares at Walt wondering if he will finish the deed and decide to kill him. Walt raises the pistol only to slowly lower it to the ground and slide it over to Jesse. Jesse briefly glances at the door and then to the gun and quickly picks it up and holds it on Walt. Walt then tells him, Do it. However, Jesse refuses to until Walt says that he is in fact the one who wants to die. Say the words! Say you want this! Nothing happens until I hear you say it! I want this. Jesse ragefully holds the pistol only to see a bloody gunshot wound in Walt's side. Instead, he chooses to drop the pistol and tells Walt to do it himself. Then do it yourself. Jesse has spent the majority of the show being a character who is placed in situations as a direct result of Walt's actions, at one point going so far as to kill an innocent man on Walt's orders. This moment serves as a point of freedom for Jesse, as he refuses to kill Walt not out of a lack of desire, but simply to liberate himself from Walt's control, instead placing the obligation of Walt's death on Walt himself. As soon as Jesse leaves, a ringtone sounds throughout the clubhouse. Walt rummages through Todd's pockets and finds his cell phone. We then cut to Lydia in her house looking pale and worn out. She asks if it is done and if he is gone, to which Walt pridefully replies, Yeah, it's done. He's gone. They're all gone. Walt asks her how she is feeling, stating that if she is feeling like she has the flu, it is because he slipped ricin into her stevia that morning, providing the audience one last crowd-pleasing line. Well. Goodbye, Lydia. An immensely thirst-quenching fate for a hateful character which ties up the last of the loose ends related to Jack's meth business. As Jesse opens the door to Jack's El Camino, he glances back at Walt. The two share accepting looks and Walt gives Jesse a final nod. Jesse then climbs into his newly acquired car and speeds away from the complex crying tears of relief and screaming with the joy of freedom. <laughs> After he leaves, Walt begins feeling the pain from his gunshot wound and walks away from the clubhouse into Jack's meth lab. He taps on a pressure gauge and admires the equipment found in the lab. While walking through the lab, the distant sound of sirens grows closer. As Walt picks up a respirator, Badfinger's Baby Blue begins playing. Walt reaches out his hand to a shining kettle as the police cars are seen in the background. We then see a close-up shot of Walt's metallic reflection in the kettle as he slowly falls backwards leaving a bloody handprint, giving us a final direct overhead shot of Walt's lifeless face with a faint smile on it. The camera then slowly pans up as police enter the lab. Walt dies as a man who lost everything but cleared up all loose ends and died in the place where he felt alive. And that is the end of Breaking Bad. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh my. What an astonishing and unparalleled achievement. While it may not be the best episode of the show, it is nonetheless an excellent and immensely satisfying episode. Ozymandias and Granite State were the episodes which brought Walter White to his absolute lowest point. He lost Hank in spite of his best efforts, and gave Jesse up to Jack out of vengeance and to fulfill his dying sense of pride. He was then left with a single barrel of cash in a car with a leaking gas tank, only to end up wandering through the desert to desperately attempt to get back to his family. But Hank's death left him alienated from them. Walt's only method to help his family was to take the blame for himself by belittling Skylar on the phone in the presence of the police. Walt then hid from justice, growing into a thin and disheveled shell of his former self. After spending six months mustering up the confidence to go to the local bar, he realized that there was nothing he could do to help his family. Walter Jr. hated him for what he had done and refused to accept his money. Walt then believed that everything he had done was ultimately forfeit. But his confidence was restored when he realized that Elliot and Gretchen could give him the ability to give the money to his family. Walt's only drive after this was revenge against the men who destroyed his life. He said his goodbye to Skylar and told her the words she had known for a long time but had never heard Walt admit to, providing the audience with a perfect bittersweet conclusion for both characters who have spent the show as longtime rivals who finally came to understand each other only after it was too late to go back. Walt's vengeance taken out against Jack is immensely thirst-quenching. It is the true fulfillment of Vince Gilligan's idea for the character of Walter White stemming from the concept of changing a character from Mr. Chips to Scarface, with Walt unleashing his rage and murdering all of Jack's crew with a machine gun 
before killing him personally in the same way that Jack mercilessly killed his brother-in-law. Mixed in with this fury is a touching act of mercy where Walt chooses to spare Jesse. Walt taunted Jack to save his own life in the moment, but in addition to this, killing Jack wasn't enough for him. Walt still hated Jesse for leading Hank to arresting him. He had every intent to activate that remote and kill everyone including himself with his machine gun trap. But it was only after seeing what Jesse had become that Walt once again saw a little bit of himself in Jesse. He realized that Jesse had grown just as tortured as he was, and rather than finishing the deed, he chose to save his life, taking a bullet for Jesse as he protected him from the gunfire. Jesse also manages to claim his own revenge against the man who murdered the woman he cared about, and sadistically forced him to be Jack's meth-cooking slave. Following this, he separates himself from Walt's manipulation by refusing to kill Walt, resulting in both men being able to share accepting glances as both of them depart on understanding terms. Walt, having finally accepted his fate and having completed everything he set out to do, managed to die on his own terms and in the place where he felt most alive in. A man who died only after he had truly lived. It is a tragic yet touching tale of a character who is arrogant and narcissistic, but because of all the time the audience has spent with Walt, we have come to sympathize with him, thus making his send-off emotionally rich and immensely satisfying. Beyond his sharp writing, Vince Gilligan shows immense talent in the realm of direction. In both the opening and conclusion of the episode, police siren lights are used to show the inevitability of Walt's fate. He spends the episode outrunning or evading the police and manages to die just before they had the ability to arrest him. Following in the tradition of the show, Gilligan uses directorial motifs of the direct overhead and low angle shots. Immense care was taken to keep continuity consistent for Walt's appearance, as well as every plot detail which had been set up in previous episodes early in the season. He also manages to draw the audience's attention to details such as the stevie in the coffee shop, which results in an excellent payoff when Walt reveals the reason he acquired the ricin at his condemned house. While it isn't subtle, he also uses the wooden pillar in Skylar's new house to illustrate the divide which has separated them, just before Walt breaks this divide by telling Skylar why he did the things he did. The carnage created by Walt's machine gun booby trap is filmed in a way which is chaotic, yet always clear to watch. Small motifs such as first person POV shots and Walt seeing reflections of himself are also used in this episode. Walt kills Jack in a way which ingeniously calls back to Hank's death with a bullet interrupting him mid-sentence, and using the rare directorial choice of having blood cover the camera lens. Topped off finally by the perfect soundtrack choice of Baby Blue, which calls back to Walt's Blue Sky Meth, whilst also serving as the perfect theme for Heisenberg to die to. This episode is as close to perfect of a conclusion that I can imagine for this show. All of the characters are written with methodical consistency, and the plot flows with exquisite structure. In regards to flaws, there are only the slightest contrivances which assist Walt in evading the police and helping him kill Jack's crew. These contrivances usually assist a component of a scene, however they are never at the cost of logic or consistency thus making them what you might call nitpicks, valid flaws which don't have any significant bearing on the story. From beginning to end, the entire show remained consistent managing to give several characters long-running arcs which had logical progression and were handled in an incredibly careful way. The final season is a tragic season as it revolves around the fall of Heisenberg, with several people that Walt worked closely with being killed as a result of the instability created by Walt's decision to kill Gus Fring. Everything Walt worked for blew up in his face, but he managed to pull through and provide hope for his family while also taking vengeance against the men who ruined his life. It's an incredible episode which is tightly written despite featuring the season's most crowd-pleasing payoffs. To the showrunners and everyone involved with making this season and the final episode possible, I say well done. Breaking Bad is one of the best television shows of all time, and this finale, just like all of the final season, was pivotal to solidifying the show as such. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what you think about this format. I typically cover flaws in films and tend to make videos that are topical rather than to cover whole pieces of media. I wanted to change things up a bit and cover something which I believe to be of excellent quality. I saw this episode fitting seeing that Breaking Bad is one of the best TV shows of all time and that its finale is incredibly well written. If you appreciate this format, I will try to create more videos like this in the future, so long as I am passionate enough about a particular film or TV show. Until then, thanks again, and I will see you next time. Bounce. El Camino, do not screw this up. <laughs> 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 <laughs>